Amen. A tremendous message. Thank you, Brother John, for that. Well, I'm excited to have Dr. Don Sisk speak for us tonight. This is our first Tuesday night. Also, for First Baptist Church, this is going to wrap up our missions emphasis time. We've had just, I think, some excellent time on Sundays with the missions, missionaries who have been live on Skype. Many of you have commented that you enjoyed seeing them, hearing about their ministries there. And tonight, I've asked Dr. Sisk to... Dr. Sis to preach a mission emphasis style sermon. At the end, for our First Baptist Church members, we'll have a card for faith promise commitments. Many guests here tonight feel no obligation to give to the missions program at First Baptist Church. But if God so inclines your heart, we'll send it off to missions as well. Don't worry about that. Uh, but I'm glad to see here. I had a great time in supper with Dr. Sisk. I'm always encouraged by a man who is just 38 years old mentally and physically and energy-wise. And he said he was 88 years old, but as sharp as fry. I, can, I, I hope when I'm 88, I can still move like that. He was talking about how after he served missions there in Japan, became the Far East Director for BIMI, and then came back and became president of the board, mission board there, BIMI. When that was done after 19 years, then approached by Pastor Chapel there to help with the mission program there at Lancaster and West Coast uh, Baptist College. He had mentioned this little phrase at supper, and he said, I thought that my greatest work was done when I finished being a president there of BIMI. He said, but I, and he kind of got a little contemplative, Dr. Sis, you did. He goes, but maybe it wasn't. Maybe it's right now. He's been preaching. Uh, he said, I think all but two Sundays in the last year, preaching in mission conferences and churches, and I'm excited that we were able to have him tonight to speak for us um, with the, the wealth of knowledge and experience that he has, but more importantly, the love for God that he has and for mission. So, Dr. Sisk, as you come and preach, I'm glad you're here. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Pastor. Thank you, Pastor Al. It's a uh, blessing to be with you and your dear family. We had a wonderful time together at Cracker Barrel. You can't go wrong at Cracker Barrel, amen. And... Uh, it's a joy to be here at uh, First Baptist Church. I always have to check where I'm at because sometimes I make the mistake and I'm at the wrong church, okay? But uh, I, I heard a story the other day about this uh, uh, two boys in Duke uh, University, and uh, they were going to a Halloween party, and they decided to dress up like the uh, mascot for the Duke Blue Devils in their devil outfit. And uh, they got to the wrong address. They thought they were at the right place, but it was, it was a church they went into. And when they went in that church, everybody, everybody left, some of them by the window, some of them by the door, but they were all out of there except one very healthy lady, and she got stuck in the pew. And uh, she couldn't get away, and they came to order. They thought, well, we're going to help her, and they had forgotten that the reason she's scared is because of the way they're dressed. And that she, they got to her, and, and she said, whoa, 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 whoa don't, don't, don't bother me, don't bother me. He, she said, I've, I've been a member of this church for 25 years, and I'm on your side, okay? <laughs> so uh, thank God it's good to be on the right side, amen. We've had some great songs tonight, some great singing, too. And uh, a lot of it has to do with uh, uh, our sins are gone, into the depths of the sea and behind the back of God and wonderful, it's wonderful to know that we've been justified because of the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ. And uh, thank you, Pastor Hal, for letting me come tonight. Uh, open your Bibles to uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 9. 2 Corinthians chapter 9. That'll be easy for you to find, so... Uh, if you don't mind, would you stand as we honor God's word as I read tonight? Second Corinthians chapter 9. It's a joy to see many of my friends here tonight, but particularly to see uh, Brother Ms. Josh Reed, uh, Mead. I'm sorry, not Reed, Mead. I do know your name, Josh, okay? And uh, they're great missionaries at, in uh, uh, Senegal, West Africa. So uh, pray for them. Wonderful, wonderful people. 2 Corinthians chapter 9. I'm going to speak of, on a very familiar subject for me. I have no idea uh, how I'm going to go with it. Uh, I'm, I'm reminded of the uh, country preacher. He said all these city preachers, they uh, get their sermon title on Monday and study all week and then the, about Saturday... The devil gets into it and messes it all up. 
And he said, uh, when I get up to preach Sunday morning, even the devil don't know what I'm going to preach about. Amen. <laughs> so, uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 9, just three verses. But what I'm going to preach about tonight is just mission giving. Uh, some call it grace giving. Some call it faith promise giving. Uh, I think on your commitment card, it will just say uh, mission giving. But in 2 Corinthians chapters 8 and 9, <clears throat> the Apostle Paul is writing to the church at Corinth. He's writing them, and if you read all of 2 Corinthians 8 and 9, and it'd be good for you to read that before Sunday, not while I'm preaching tonight, okay? But if you read all of that, you'll find out 2 Corinthians 8 and 9 is about one subject. And the subject is an offering. Now, the offering was not for the church at Corinth. It was to be given through the church at Corinth, but it was for others. And when we think about an offering for something other than our local church, uh, immediately we think about missions, okay? So in essence, 2 Corinthians 8 and 9 is mission. All through chapter 8, all through chapter 9, Paul is emphasizing giving to missions. And he gets down to verse 6 in chapter 9 and makes this statement. Look at it. But this I say, he who is soweth sparingly shall reap also sparingly. And he which soweth bountifully shall reap also bountifully. Every man, according as he purposeth in his heart, so let him give, not grudgingly or of necessity, for God loveth a cheerful giver. And God is able to make all grace abound toward you, that you always having all sufficiency in all things may abound to every good work. Mission giving. Let's pray. Dear Lord, I'd sure like to be a blessing to your people tonight. But I know the only way I could do that would it be that you would bless me and use me. So I pray that, that will happen tonight. I pray you'll anoint my mind that I could think right, my tongue that I could speak right, but most of all, my heart that I would be right. And dear Lord, speak to your people tonight. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. You may be seated. In all of 2 Corinthians 8 and 9, Paul has been talking about giving and receiving. And he gets down to verse 6 in chapter 9, <clears throat> and he starts talking about sowing and reaping. Now, has Paul done what many of us Baptist preachers do to me? Gotten off of his subject. I never will forget being in West Virginia one time. I used that illustration. It must have been a good one. Might have been a Dr. Gibbs in, uh, illustration. Amen. Just keeps going and going and going. And when I got to the end of that illustration, I had forgotten what I was illustrating. And uh, there were a couple of missionaries on the front seat. I had to look at one of them. Hey, could you help me get back on my subject? Do you know where I was? So uh, you folks close to the front, uh, you might have to help me tonight, okay? Is that what's happened to Paul? No. He's talking about giving and receiving, but he says in verse 6, But this I say, <clears throat> he was so sparingly shall reap also sparingly. He was so bountifully shall reap also bountifully. So what he's saying is this. Sowing and reaping is like giving and receiving. Or giving and receiving is like sowing and reaping. 
So he's using an, an analogy. So I want us to think about three things tonight. Number one, in verse 6, I want us to think about the principles involved in missionary giving. The principles involved. In verse 7, we think about the purposing of the giver. Okay? And then in verse 8, the provision for the giver. Now, if I go too long on one point, you'll know at least what I meant to say, okay? So let's look at verse 6 and talk about the principles involved in missionary giving. He that soweth sparingly shall reap also sparingly. He that soweth bountifully shall reap also bountifully. Four simple principles of giving and receiving. Number one, you reap what you sow. Number two, you reap more than you sow. Number three, you reap in proportion as you sow. And number four, you reap after you sow. Now, the wonderful thing about that is all four of those principles apply to giving to missions. You reap what you sow. Remember what Jesus said to his disciples on the Sermon on the Mount. Lay not up for yourself treasures on earth where moth and rust is corrupt, where thieves break to and steal. But lay up for yourself treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust is corrupt and where thieves do not break through nor steal. Sad thing is, most of God's people are far more concerned about materialistic things than they are about spiritual, eternal things. You reap what you sow. Uh, let's have confession tonight, okay? I'll confess for you, but I'll confess for me. We spend most of our time, most of our God-given abilities, and most of our treasures on earthly, temporal things. If we are going to have anything that will last for eternity, then we have to start using our time, our talents, and our treasures for spiritual, eternal things. You are going to reap what you sow. Number two, you reap more than you sow. If you take a grain of corn, you can do anything you want to with that one grain of corn. Uh, ladies used to have what they called ecology boxes. They put all kinds of seed and stuff, put a glass in front of it, hang it up somewhere. You could put that grain of corn in an ecology box. Or you could just lay it up somewhere. And all it would ever be would be one grain of corn. But if you plant that grain of corn, the first thing that happens to that grain of corn is it dies. But in the process of dying, it produces a stalk of corn. The little stalk breaks its way out of the ground. When it is full grown, it will have at least two ears of corn and each of those ears of corn will have about 750 grains of corn. Uh, now, that's Kentucky corn. may not be quite that good in Michigan. I'm not sure. But think about it. In one growing season, one grain of corn planted has been responsible for producing 1,500 grains of corn. When you are giving to missions, 
you are going to reap a whole lot more than you sow. I believe from the depth of my heart, by the way, pick up one of the books if you don't already have it, where all of your missionaries are listed and pictured there. Think about it. When you're giving to missions through First Baptist Church, you have a part in every missionary that's supported by this church. Now think about how much you're going to reap in eternity. Let me give you one illustration. Virginia and Renee and Tim and myself went to Japan in 1965. 1966, we started a church in Osaka called the Sydney Newtown Baptist Church. The very first service we had, the little room we had rented would seat about 60 people. But 60 people is a big, a big congregation in Japan. It seat about 60 people. The room began to fill up. I was down on the front first story of the building. The room was on the second story. And I'd show the people up there and then come back down and greet other people. And a young man came up to me, and uh, he had a pamphlet in his hand that we had handed out. And he said to me, Mr. Sisk, it had my picture on one side, had Kate Takazi's picture on the other side. He was my interpreter. We'd only been there a year, so I wasn't preaching in Japanese. He said, Mr. Sisk, and he spoke nearly perfect English, I want you to know I don't have any interest in Christianity. I understand you're speaking through an interpreter. And I came here tonight to practice my English. I'm an English major at Kansai University working on my master's degree. And I had two real bad thoughts. Number one, I didn't come 7,000 miles so somebody could practice English. And then I thought, my Kentucky English is nothing to practice on. <laughs> so both of us are in bad shape. But I got alone before the message that night. Got my heart right at that. And I, I preached a very simple message. By the way, all my messages are simple. Now, some preachers have a hard time preaching simple sermons. I've never had that problem. I just preach everything I know, amen? <laughs> and it's simple. I preach a very simple message. Now, veteran missionaries had said, you shouldn't give an invitation until you've been there several weeks or something. And I thought, ah, I'm, you know, I don't want to be a smart addict, okay? But I'm not going to preach the gospel without giving an invitation. And I gave an invitation. Tonight, if you'd like to trust Jesus Christ as your Savior, would you lift your hand? And 11 people lifted their hand. Guess what? He was one of them. And uh, since he spoke English, I dealt with him, okay? And that night, a young man by the name of Sogoto Ogawa trusted Jesus Christ as his Savior. Uh, after he got saved, he lost all of his interest in English. All he wanted to do was study the Bible, pray, be at our house, go visit, whatever. About six months after he was saved, he and I had been out visiting one night. We were eating noodles. He stopped slurping. They can eat noodles a whole lot faster than I can. He stopped slurping and uh, looked at me. He said, teacher, I'd like to spend my whole life just doing what you're doing. Now, he didn't know the terminology, but that's a call to preach, amen. Yeah. But he said, I'll have to go home and tell my mother, my brother, and my sisters about this. Can you imagine? Young college student going home, hey, Mom, I got saved. God's called me to preach. 
That'd be a good, good news for a lot of mothers here in America, but not in Japan. For 72 hours without stopping, one person after another tried to persuade him of what a horrible mistake he had made and to denounce his faith in Jesus Christ. His mother, his sister, his brother, the Buddhist priest, the mayor, he's from a very well-to-do family in the major Japan. Finally, his mother said, so go to, go to the temple, go to the tomb, and worship your father. And he, I cannot do that. They threw him out of the house. Don't ever come back again. We never want to see you again. He came to my house for the house after that. When I went to the door, he looked like a dead man. And he told me in detail what I've told you very briefly tonight. He said in essence, I love my mother. I love my sister. I love my brother. I love my country. But I love Jesus more than all these. And all I could think that night was, God is making a diamond. The only difference between a diamond and a piece of coal is the pressure applied. That was uh, 1966. 2021. He has pastored that church for the last 53 years. Uh, the church runs about 700. Say, well, that's not so big. Go to Japan and find one bigger, okay? You won't do it. Uh, I was there for the 50th anniversary. A choir of 63 people sang. Every one of them. They were all in full-time Christian ministry. Every one of them had been saved there, discipled there, went to Bible school. And they're now in full-time Christian ministry. They've got seven missionaries on foreign fields. They've started eight other churches. Last year, they gave $300,000 to missions. You say, well, what does that have to do with going and reaping? Think of the people that supported Virginia and me. By the way, they did it by faith. They didn't have any idea where God would use us or not. When you start supporting a missionary, you never know what God may do. By the way, that won't stop until Jesus comes. It just goes on and on and on. You reap what you sow. You reap more than you sow. Number three, you reap in proportion as you sow. In other words, the more you sow, the more you'll reap. That was illustrated to me very vividly years ago. I was pastoring in Providence, Kentucky. There's a little town about 10 miles away named Diamond. I went down there to preach one Sunday afternoon. They didn't have a pastor. The moderator, he did the meeting. And uh, he said, now we're going to take an offering for Brother Fisk. And all the offering today will go to him. And I was sitting on the front seat like that. And uh, I got a dollar bill out of my pocket, put it in the offering plate. So we had the service that day. At the end of the service, he gave me an envelope. And uh, on the way home that day, I said to Virginia, I said, hon, uh, look in the envelope, see what the offering was. Now, None of you preachers would do that, okay? But I was kind of anxious to see it. And when she looked, she started laughing. And I said, "Honey, what's, what's so funny? She said, Don, guess what's in here? I thought, two or three hundred dollars. 
She said, a one dollar bill. And I said, that's strange. I put a dollar in the offering plate. And she was laughing hilariously. And I said, hon, it ain't funny. <laughs> and she said, you know, Don, if you would have put more in. <laughs> huh? Hey, if you put more in, if you put more in, if you put more in, you get more in. You reap what you sow. You reap more than you sow. But you'll reap in proportion as you sow. And by the way, you'll reap after you sow. I mean, any little child will understand those four principles. Sad thing is in giving, a lot of people want to reap first and then or I want to uh, reap before they sow. And it don't work like that. Uh, I had a good friend in Columbia, South Carolina. He'd taken Virginia and I out to dinner one night, and, uh, or one day uh, for lunch. And uh, he and I sat in the car and talked after she went to the motel. And different things. Then he said to me, he said, Brother Shed, if I ever win the Reader's Digest Suite, I'm going to give a lot of money to mission. And I got all excited because I know a lot of people have won that, don't you? No, you don't know anybody. <laughs> now, evidently, somebody does. I don't know. but You know what he's saying? If I could reap first, I'd start sowing something. It don't work like that. Bring you all the ties in the storehouse See if I'm not open the windows of heaven. When? When you bring the tithe, I'll open the windows. Give, and it shall be given unto you good measure, pressed down, shaken together, and running over. When are you going to get it like that? When you start giving. So it's a very simple thing. You reap what you sow, you reap more than you sow. You reap in proportion as you sow, and you reap after you sow. Now look at verse 7. You have your Bibles open. I want you to read this verse with me all together. I love to hear groups of people read the Bible together. Now, I, I know some churches, it would sound like uh, the United Nations, all kinds of languages. But I think we all have the same Bible, amen? If you don't, you ought to get you one, okay? Look at verse 7. Read it with me all together, okay? Every man, according as he purposeth in his heart, so let him give, not grudgingly or of necessity, for God loveth a cheerful giver. Now, this time, just the first two words all together. Every man. All right, once again. Every man. Come on, you can do better than that. Pretend you're at the big house football game and uh, get excited like you would there. Think about it. Okay, all together, one time, real big. Every man. Okay. Now, Paul is in every man according as he purposeth in his heart. So let him give. Okay? Now, you don't have a Bible teacher. You don't have a concordance. You got to figure this out all for yourself. Who do you think Paul expected to give something? Every man. And all the women said, Amen, let the man give. <laughs> hey, by the way, it's not talking about gender. It's talking about every mankind. Every man, every woman, every boy, every girl. Wouldn't it be something, Pastor Al, if every member of First Baptist Church took one of these cards and every member 
promise to give something every week for mission. By the way, parents, teach your children to give. Uh, ladies, uh, give every man, every woman, every boy, every, everybody ought to give something to missions every week. Now look, every man, according as he can figure out from his budget, so let him give. Is that what your Bible says? If it is, you've got a real bad translation, amen. No. Every man, according as he purposeth in his heart, purpose, contemplate, think about it. By the way, pray about it. Talk to God about it. Ask God. Dear God, what would you have me to give to missions every week above my tithe? Now, don't take part of your tithe and offering. No, no. This is above and beyond your tithe and your offering. Every man, according as he purposes in his heart. There's 7.9 billion people on planet Earth. Conservatively speaking, two-thirds of them have never one time heard a clear presentation of the gospel message. Remember a man by the name of Bob Hughes who was a missionary in the Philippines. He got cancer at a young age in, I think, maybe early 50s and was dying. They finally persuaded him to come home. One of the last places he preached was at First Baptist Church in Hammond, Indiana. He preached a sermon by the name of I Sat Where They Sat. And in that sermon, he made this statement, and he preached it several times. But this is the last time he would ever preach. He preached a sermon and said, most of the people in the Philippines are dying and going to hell because they've never heard the true gospel. There was a young man there that night, that day. He reached over and put his hand on his wife, Becky's hand, and said, Becky, we're going to the Philippines. That young man was Rick Martin. He went to the Philippines 40 years ago now. I was there in 2018, workers and pastors conference. Now think about it. He went there, he started a church. Then he started a Bible college. Then he urged other churches to start Bible colleges. And from that one nucleus, there are now now, if I didn't know this for a fact, I wouldn't believe it. So if you don't believe it, I, I understand, okay? But from that one nucleus, there are now 1,300 independent Baptist churches. Wow. Every man according as he purposeth in his heart. Let your heart get into your giving. Not, not just your head, and not just look at you, but not. Let God speak to your heart. Every man according as he purposeth in his heart. So let him give. So I hope when the mission emphasis is all over at this particular time, that every member of First Baptist Church would make a commitment to give something to missions every week above their time and offering. Now look at verse 8. And God is able. By the way, <clears throat> if that's all we got out of the message tonight is if God is able, uh, that'd be good, amen? And by the way, 
Paul could have said, and God is able to do anything. And aren't we glad that he is? His power has not been diminished regardless of what people think. He is still in control. Aren't we glad that people who think they're in control are not in, really in control? I look forward to the 21st day of every month. Proverbs. I read one proverb every day. Proverbs 21, 1 says, The king's heart is in the hand of the Lord. As rivers of water, he turneth it whithersoever he will. By the way, he may not be doing it the way I think he ought to, but he's doing it the way the sovereign God knows that it needs to be done. Every man and God is able. Look at something here. Look at, look at it real carefully. God is able to make all grace abound for you, that ye always, having all sufficiency in all things, may abound to every good work. What's, what's Paul saying? When I take a commitment card like this and I pray about it and I think about it and then God lays an amount on my heart and I, I take my pen or my pencil and I write the amount in. Then I put it in the offering plate or take it up regardless of how they take it up. And then every week and you say, well, I get paid every month. Okay. Divide by four. Okay. Uh, you put that money in the offering plate. You made the commitment. Now you're keeping the commitment that you made. Then he said, now look at it. God is able to make all grace abound toward you. Who? The ones that have made commitments that ye always having all sufficiency in all things may abound to every good work. Now think about this real seriously. When you make a commitment, and you ought to everybody. I know uh, some ladies say, well, I, I don't work outside the home, so I don't have a salary. But you do control some money, don't you? Yeah, go ahead and admit it, amen. And uh, every boy, every girl, I have a, a little phrase for teenagers. It goes like this. Tuck a buck a week away. Even teenagers could give a dollar a week, amen. See, everybody, everybody could do something. When I make the commitment, turn it in. Week after week, I keep the commitment. Then God says, then I'm going to give it to you so you'll have to give to others. The provision is not my ability to give. It's God. Let me give a real simple personal testimony. I made my first faith promise commitment in 1968 after hearing Dr. Billy McCarroll explain missionary giving, faith promise giving. Since that time, 19 and 68. Every year I have increased my faith promise giving. My first faith promise commitment was $5 a week. But for 53 years, every year, I've increased my faith promise giving. About 15 years ago, the largest one item in our budget every year became faith promise giving, mission giving. Now, you can't start there, but you start where you are. I want you to repeat something after, with me again, okay? Now, now, let's don't have to do it four or five times. You listen real carefully, and uh, then repeat after me, okay? okay. It's, it's a simple words. You don't have any problem with it. Everyone giving something. 
All right, once again. Everyone giving something. And everyone giving more than he ever gave before. Now, it doesn't take a rocket scientist to figure that out. If everybody gave something, and the ones that are giving increase their giving, and they give more, then your mission giving will increase exponentially. God has been good to us in North America, has he not? Uh, people on welfare in America are rich compared to the people of the world. Many American Christians receive from God like this. But thank God, many have learned to receive from God like this. You know something? That's all God needs. There's some channels that he can flow his blessings through them. Last week we had 60 new missionaries at our place at Baptist International Missions. Those missionaries have to raise a lot of money to get to the field, Keep to have do the work uh, to, to live and so on and so forth. And you think about it. And it, it, sometimes you think, well, wouldn't it be great if we had a bunch of millionaires that would just get in here and give all that money? That they... But the bottom line is, God doesn't need millionaires. Now, if you're a millionaire, uh, that that's not wrong. Okay. Just use your millions for the glory of God. Amen. All God needs is some channels. Will you be a channel of God's blessing? Every man, according as he purposeth in his heart, so let him give. Let's pray together. Pastor. Lord, thank you for this message. Lord, thank you for the servant who delivered it, Lord, and just the truth from your word. And Lord, may we be faithful, honest, and generous, Lord, with what you've given to us. Lord, I pray that as we think and pray about what we ought to do, that we would approach it not from external pressure, Lord, but from pressure that comes from you to please you. And may we use what you've blessed us with.